Hello everyone, uh, good morning to all. And um, before I proceed, I would like to make a humble request to everyone present over here to keep your switch uh, mobile phone on switch off or in airplane mode to avoid any interruptions during the session. Thank you, and uh, please allow me to introduce myself. I'm Tenzin Doma. I'm currently working as a program coordinator at Tibet House Culture Center of Islam in the Dalai Lama, New Delhi. And Tibet House Culture Center of Islam in the Dalai Lama, New Delhi, is delighted to welcome you all to the Conference on Universal Ethics, the Vision of His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama for Civilized and Peaceful World. And this day also collides with the 87th birth anniversary of His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama. Today is the most auspicious day, not only for the people of the land of the snow, but also for the entire world. Today, there is a worldwide acknowledgement of the untiring contributions made by His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama as an advocate of non-violence, compassion, secular ethics, and religious harmony, his contributions have been marked by the highest honors, including the Nobel Peace Prize in 1989 for, for advocating peace solutions based upon tolerance and mutual respect in order to preserve the historical and cultural heritage of his people. He was also awarded the prestigious 2012 Templeton Prize, which recognized his engagement with science and with people far beyond his own religious traditions, and for focusing on the connections between the investigative traditions of science and Buddhism. On behalf of Tibet House Culture Center of His Holiness the Dalai Lama New Delhi, we would like to extend our warm welcome to our respected special guest, Ambassador Mr. Virendra Gupta Ji, President of Antra Rashtriya Sayog Parishad, Dr. S. P. Agarwal Ji, Principal at A. K. Ramanujan College, Delhi University, and our keynote speaker, Venerable Geshe Dajidam Dila, Director of Tibet House, New Delhi, and our guest, Professor Kaviri Gilji, uh, professor and head of the Department of International Relations and Governance Studies at Shiv Nadar University. And also Mr. Kamasujala, a contemporary Tibetan artist and our esteemed speakers and the guests and the participants gathered here for today's conference on universal ethics, un the vision of His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama for civilized and peaceful world. Now I would like to request our special guest ambassador, Mr. Virendra Gupta Ji, Dr. S. P. Agarwal Ji, our keynote speaker, Venerable Geshe Dajid Amdila, Professor Kaviri Gilji, Mr. Kamasujala, to kindly light the lamp of wisdom and request to take their respected seats on their dais, please.
Thank you. And now I would like to request venerables from Debung Loseling Monasteries to kindly recite a prayer for the long life and the swift fulfillment of the wishes of His Holiness the Bhutin Dalai Lama. Jesus, Kujengi Jawa <laughs> Uh, 
Thank you, Gila. Uh, now I would like to request Venerable Geshe Doji Damdula, Director of Tibet House, to kindly offer uh, pres our present the souvenir and the kada to our esteemed uh, special guest and the guest, please. Uh, Ambassador Virendra Gupta ji, come on. Dr. S. P. Agarwalji. <laughs> Professor Kaviri Gilji. Mr. Gama Sichula. Thank you, Venerable Kishila. Before we begin with the actual session, I would like to briefly introduce about Tibet House and its activities. Tibet House Cultural Center of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, New Delhi, was established in 1965 by His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama of Tibet for the purpose of preserving the cultural heritage of Tibet at the time when it faced the extinct extinction in the homeland as as well as the providing a center for Tibetan cultures and Buddhist studies. Tibet House New Delhi was the first of its kind in the world, and His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama was the first of its, uh, was recurring emphasis on developing a sense of universal harmony, compassion as its own effective antidote to global suffering together with the needs for a meaningful exchange between different religious and cultural tradition, which also had a profound effect on the purpose and its activities of Tibet House. Next. Over a period of five decades since its inception, Tibet House has come to recognize as the significant institution for a dissemination of Tibetan culture for our Buddhist studies. Tibet House has a museum of available Tibetan arts and artifacts for a purpose in His Holiness word to bring the heritage of the past in close contact. And Tibet House also has a museum housing a sizable collection of an important books and manuscript, a publication unit which publicized, publishes uh, around 10 to 15 books in a year, and a program division which regularly organizes lectures, conferences, seminars, film screenings, and exhibitions on Tibetan and Nalanda Buddhist history, science, religion, philosophies, art, literature, and culture where it witnesses the vital and evolving her heritage of Tibetan people. Tibet House also offers three different courses on Nal uh, Nalanda Buddhist philosophy. The Nalanda Master's Course, which was launched on 9 December 2016 on the occasion of 51st anniversary of Tibet House, New Delhi, in the gracious presence of His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama, along with the Sri Kiran Rejuji, the Union Minister, Minister of Home, 
Home Affairs and Shri Najib Jung, Lieutenant Governor of Delhi. At present, a five years Nalanda Master's course on uh, Nalanda Buddhist philosophy in which 360 participants and from 39 different con uh, countries have already completed their first batch. And the Nalanda Diploma course, which was launched in 2018, three different batches have been successfully completed. And the purpose of these courses are there is a genuine need in the modern world to introduce the short duration course in English language in a very systematic and a comprehensive way covering various Buddhist subjects that are studied and practiced in the tradition of Nalanda and Tibetan monastic universities. Tiveros also introduced two months Nalanda certificate course being offered to students who wish to acquire knowledge of various Buddhist subjects in order to lay a good foundation of Nalanda Buddhist philosophies to find a meaningful life. And also, it is also a rare opportunity to commit oneself to such a course to become eligible for the second batch of Nalanda master's course, which is going to be launched today. Tiveros also offer Tibetan language course on a regular basis, there are four different levels of learning offered at, at the very nominal fees with the special concession for the students and monastics. Till date, 22 batches have been successfully completed. Thank you. And now I would like to request Mr. Tenzin Choktenla, General Secretary of Tibet House, New Delhi, to kindly address the gathering. Mm -hmm. uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, before I start, uh, I'd like to thank everyone so, uh, for joining in here today. So on behalf of Tibet House, Culture Center of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, it gives me a great pleasure to extend a warm welcome to our special guests, Ambassador Virinder Guptaji, President Antarashtriya Sayyok Parishad, and uh, Professor S.P. Agarwal, Principal, Ramanujan College, Delhi University. We are honored to have you here today, sir. I would, like to, uh, I would also like to welcome Dr. Kaveri Ji, Professor, uh, Head at Department of International Relations and Governance Studies, Shivnada University, uh, Mr. Kamasiche, contemporary artist and one of the judges of the Tibet House Art Competition, Venerable Geshe Dojo Damdullah, Director, Tibet House, New Delhi, and, and all the respected speakers and participants. Today, on this joyous occasion of the 87th birth anniversary of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Tibet House has come up with a conference on universal ethics. Universal ethics is the first of His Holiness's four principal commitments. First, as a human being, His Holiness is concerned with encouraging people to be happy, uh, helping them understand that if their minds are upset, mere physical comfort will not bring them peace. But if their minds are at peace, even physical pain will not disturb the calm. He advocates the cultivation of warm-heartedness and human values such as compassion, forgiveness, tolerance, contentment, and self-discipline. He says that as human beings, we are all the same. We all want happiness and do not want suffering. Even people who have no religious belief can benefit if they incorporate these human values into their lives. His holiness refers to such human values as secular ethics or universal values. He has always been committed to talking about the importance of such values and sharing them with everyone he meets. So in today's conference, we have tried to bring together various speakers from different backgrounds to, to reflect upon the vision of His Holiness the Dalai Lama in bringing about the need for secular ethics in this age of globalization and increasing interdependence. So without further ado, I request Ms. Tenzing Domala to kindly proceed with today's event and I hope that this conference will be a great benefit to all the participants. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Choktenla. 
Now may I request Professor Kaveri Gilji, Head of the Department of International Relations and Governance Studies, Shivnada University, to kindly introduce the Interfaith Service to Ms. Samboda Fellowship, Fellowship and declare the art competition winners, which Tibet House yearly organized. Bef please allow me to introduce Professor Kaveri Gilji. Professor Gavrili Gilji is a professor and head of the Department of International Relations, Governance Studies at Shivnada University. She is a former principal of Dal Dalai Lama Institute of Higher Education, Bangalore. And Dr. Kaveri La has also completed the Nalanda Master's Course, Batch 1 at Tibet House, New Delhi. Please welcome Dr. Kaveri La. Dashi Deli, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Tenzin Domala and Choktin La. So, uh, respected special guests, Ambassador Virindra Gupta Ji, uh, Professor S.P. Agarwal Ji, Venerable Geshe Doji um Karma Sichula, all our respected panelists and guests, welcome to this most wonderful and joyous occasion. Today, we stand here to celebrate His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama, who was born 87 years ago and 88 if you do Tibetan counting as a simple boy called Lamo Dundup in the vast expanse of Amdo and Taksar to be particular and how he has become such a global respected leader and figure who transcends all boundaries, all boundaries of religion, nation state, uh, you know, science and religion any kind of axis of identity that you think about. So we are here to uh, honor and uh, celebrate his birthday. And the best way to do that is really to think about what he has guided us in these many decades and to see how best we are able to follow this. So to introduce this conference, I would like to quote from the present Secretary General of the UN, Antonio Guterres. And he said recently that humanity is facing a perfect storm of crisis that is widening inequality between the North and the South, that is really between developed countries and the developing countries. This divide is not only morally unacceptable, but dangerous. A serious deterioration in living conditions of the most vulnerable populations and further threatening peace and security in a conflicted world. The global food, energy and financial crisis unleashed by the war in Ukraine have hit countries already reeling from the pandemic and the climate crisis reversing what had been a growing convergence between developed and developing countries. So he says this recently, and we stand here, it's the 133rd day of the war in Ukraine. And why is this conference so important? So the way it has been designed, there are three panels. The first, the first, the theme of the first panel is universal ethics of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, the pillars for the sustainable development goals of the UNO. The second panel looks at universal ethics for disarmament and world peace. And the third one looks at the role of spirituality to stop wars. So the way this conference has been masterfully designed uh, as, uh, Choktin La gave us an idea of what exactly does His Holiness mean by the notion of universal ethics. This is his first commitment as he sets out. Basically, as we see in Beyond Religion and in his many writings, His Holiness makes a simple argument that, you know, the basis for universal ethics is something that is scientific, that has based on our common experience and our common sense as well. And essentially, in order to accept these values that may otherwise be contingent and determined by different people according to different you know notions there are two pillars that we need to accept and that is our common humanity and the second one is our fundamental interdependence so during the course of this day's long conference we are going to examine these notions um, looking at i would say in particular the first panel might look at things from the idea of the problems. So why are we where we are today? And the first panel, when it's talking about universal ethics in the context of the sustainable development goals, which we are meant to be achieving by 2030. So it is broken up into looking at it from the perspective of sociology, of economy, of environment. And finally, I would put youth as one of the solutions, which is also the 
topic of the next panel that is going to be looking at the role of psychology of education and technology the whatsapp or you know uh, the uh, in terms in a positive way and we are then going to look at the panel on you know the role of spirituality in promoting peace and not war and how critical that is so with that um, introduction to today's conference i would like to declare the winners of the thunmi sambota fellowships but before i do that i would just give a brief introduction to thunmi sambota tibetans don't need an introduction to him he was a great great scholar and the minister for culture during the reign of the 33rd 33rd king songsten gampo and he is also credited with the founding of tibetan script he comes to india in difficult circumstances and you know the script for the tibetan language which is so critical to dharma uh, proliferation in the land of snows so tibet house delhi instituted a fellowship in his name from the academic year 1987 88 and the tenure of this fellowship is for 2 years and it's extendable by 1 year at the discretion of the advisory committee which at present comprises rises of uh, ambassador nirupama rao ji professor m n desh pande professor s um rinpoche and uh, dr lokesh chandra and out of about 20 applicants the first award ever went to mr pema doji in 1987 and his monograph looked at the literary sources of the architecture and principles the ritual activities associated with the construction of the buddhist stupas at different stages and a survey of the stupas found in the upper indus valley the documentation of the leading archaeological specimens of various stupas found in the leh region of ladakh and that volume the result of his work was published by the indira gandhi national center for, of the arts ignca in collaboration with tibet house so coming now to the more recent uh, thunmi sambota fellowship uh, competition it was very competitive the judges uh, there was a panelist of uh, six panelists uh, that comprised of venerable geshe doji damdolla professor venerable geshe nawang samtinla professor hira paul gangnegi ji professor s r bhat dr kelsing wangmo uh, myself and dr shidup tenzin So these interviews were held in the autumn of last year and the selected candidates and I request a round of applause from the audience I'll go just one by one with the names <laughs> So the selected candidates I'm delighted to share was a mis mix of monastics and non-monastics. So the first candidate was uh, Venerable Geshe Larampa Nawang Toptinla, who is working on how the middle view held by all Tibetan Buddhist schools converge into one. The second selected candidate was Venerable Geshe Larampa Kelsang Tengkyong Yala and he is working on a historical account of the profound Madhyamika view from Acharya Arya Nagarjuna up until the 14th Dalai Lama and the system of explaining mool prajna by the three kirtis giving rise to different tenets lineages in Tibet. The third candidate was Mr. Shaho Tamding and he is working on a critical analysis of Ladakh's Alchi's Tibetan stone inscriptions and sculptures during the period of the Tibetan Empire. And the fourth candidate and the last was uh, Mr. Gonpo Dundup and he is working on an annotated catalog of the 14 Dalai Lama's treasured works. uh coming next uh tibet house also organized an art competition and its theme was looking at tibetan culture and as i speak and declare the results and tell more about this you can also see the images up on the powerpoint so this art competition was open to both students and the general public uh, those who were interested in exploring and revealing their artistic talents and in particular th this contest was designed to encourage people to promote tibetan culture via the submission of art so there were two entry levels a uh, school level and open entry and each category has three prizes so for the school level the first place has an award of rupees 10000 the second place has an award of rupees 7000 and the third place has a reward of rupees 5000 for the open level the first place had a reward of rupees 
The second place, a reward of rupees 15,000, and the third place, a reward of rupees 10,000, and there are consolation prizes of rupees 2,000, which have been awarded to five participants in each of the categories. The panelists of judges were uh, Karma Sichula, who is here with us, Gauri Gill, and Shioli Kanungo. So they were the three judges. So first, I will announce the school level uh, prize holders. So the first place goes to uh, Zigme Wangchuk. <laughs> the second place goes to Uma Seyang. <laughs> Beautiful. The third place goes to Tenzin Ingzel. And the consolation prizes go to Sohani Harit. Jigme Tinley. Losang Tenzin. <laughs> Dawa Naksang. <laughs> and Anil Kumar. I hope some of these artworks are for sale. <laughs> they are beautiful. <laughs> uh, the open entry uh, is uh, the winners are the, so the number for the first is Jamyang Doji Chakrishar. Wow. The second is Nawang Dagi. The third is Tenzin Namgyal. And the consolation prizes are Tenzin Nidon Jamling. Tenzin Paldon. Tenzin Lundup. Jampa Namgya. And Tenzin Chogya. So thank you so much, Kadin Che and Tukchina, and please enjoy the conference. Thank you, Professor Karuli Gilji. Now I would like to request Mr. Kama Sichila, a prominent Tibetan contemporary artist, to kindly share your thoughts on Tibetan arts and culture. And I would like to introduce him. Uh, artist Kama Sichila, raised and schooled as a refugee by Tibetan Children Village School in Dharamsala. He received a formal Tanka painting training at the Center for Tibetan Arts and Crafts in Dharamsala from renowned master Tanka painter Mr. Rinzin Paljor and his son Tashi Dorje, and he was graduated in 1994. Between 1994 to 2008, he is engaged. He was engaged in many political activities for the freedom struggle for his country, Tibet. While studying independently in classical and contemporary art forms, in 2016, he received a fellowship from Rubin Foundation for two months, artist resident residency in Wormwood Studio Center in the United States. Over 25 years of his journey as a painter has been to find his own voice and search for the ultimate truths. His interest is in the foundation of our mental attitude and the states of mind that shapes our personalities and sense of physical, uh, physical realities, how we as a species shape our future generations and the future of his 
uh, this planet. As an artist, he tries to express his feelings, the state of consciousness, and the subject matters of this day-to-day -day human story, the story of human struggles, hope, dreams. And Mr. Kamala uses color, forms, uh, forms and uh, Tibetan motifs to create the surreal abstract images. He has developed a uniquely personal visual language. Please welcome Mr. Kamala Sijila. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Kama Siju, and I live in Dramsala. And uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me, and uh, it's an honor for me to be able to uh, have, a, have an opportunity to talk on the, on about the Tibetan art, which has influenced uh, the culture as large. As an artist, uh, the art speaks about your inner voice, uh, the hopes, dreams, and sometimes the worst nightmares. And that's why it has a power to change the shape of individual's thought and, uh, and, uh, the, and the power uh, to, to change your personality and to change to through the change of personalities, you know, it influence, uh, it influence your uh, collectively, it influence the culture, it, it influence the, uh, the the community, and how it uh, it builds up the future. Yeah. So in Tibet, as a Thangka painter, you know, the art has has influence in various uh, uh, part where it's mostly uh, to deal and uh, influence with the with the spiritual practice as a thangka painter you know it's a it's a very good medium to practice and to to express your day to day and to to calm yourself it's it's like a you know, meditation yeah and uh, when I move towards the contemporary, it makes you sometimes hyper. And when I practice uh, Thangka, it calms you down. It actually calms you down and it makes you relax. But when, you, when I practice the contemporary, it makes uh, hyper sometimes. So that's how, as an artist, there's, uh, there's a power to change the uh, the, the people's mindset and the people's uh, point of view about the life and perspective. And for that, uh, individual uh, change and uh, sh personality change influence the culture. So I'm very, very glad that, uh, that the Tibet House has organized uh, the, uh, the art competitions in uh, in related with the Tibetan culture, because uh, the art, it's also about preserving the culture. It's also about uh, adapting with the, with, the, with the changing time. You know, art uh, uh, and, the, and, the, and the culture, it's not stuck. We cannot stuck, we cannot stuck. We have to move on and change according to the times. So it's a perfect medium. The art is a perfect medium to adapt with the time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gamal Sijila. Now we would like to show you the recordings of uh, recordings from Mr. Dipesh Thakur, Chief Coordinator Nalinda Nalinda International Course. S since he would not able to join due to some concomitant worries, so we would like to show you the brief introduction of Nalinda Master's Course, which he has recorded and sent us. Uh, hello, friends. Uh, I am Dipesh Thakur. 
uh, also known as Tendring Chokya. Uh, I'm the chief coordinator for Nalanda Courses, uh, Tibet House, New Delhi. So first of all, a little bit about me so that, you know, I can uh, connect better with our friends uh, who are listening to this and watching this. Um, I come from, uh, in terms of my education background, I'm an electronics engineer. I started my career straight away in a software company. I was lucky enough uh, that I got opportunity to work in Singapore and US early part of my career. And overall, I have about 25 years of experience in IT, technical fields, consulting, pre-sales, management, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, sometime in 2010, I happened to attend a course uh, in Dharamshala, uh, Tushita Dharamshala, Dharam Court actually. And that's where my journey started with uh, Buddhist philosophy. And uh, before that, I read some books and I was quite keen to know a little bit more. Uh, and working in the corporate world, I felt my, went, my mind went too much monkey mind. So I was looking for some stability of mind. So I went to this course and then again, I joined my office. And then 2012, I took a very serious decision to leave my corporate life, become a part-time consultant. Unfortunately, one of my early teachers uh, at the time, Venerable Kabirji at Tushita Delhi, introduced me to Tibet House, and I started attending uh, Venerable Geshe Dorji Dandulza's classes in 2012. And next few years, I realized that there is so much more to learn, and Geshe was extremely skillful. Uh, we were very lucky to have a teacher like Geshe in Delhi, uh, directly getting these uh, deep and profound Nalanda philosophy teachings in English. However, these were all these sessions were like walk-in sessions. So, you know, the, for a teacher, it's quite difficult to go deeper because every time in the audience, there's somebody who's very new to these philosophies, so we couldn't go deeper. In parallel, I was also doing an online course of master's, master's course in Buddhist philosophy from FPMT, Pumoy, Italy. And um, so I also felt a need where there, you know, there were two Venerable Geshe's there teaching in Tibetan and there was a translator. All of them were excellent. But at the end of the day, during translation, some issues uh, in understanding or nuances were missed. So that's when I started requesting, you know, Venerable Geshe Dorji Tantol, who's also director of Tibet House, to teach these courses. And that's how, uh, you know, initially he said no. He was just checking uh, he was just checking my seriousness. They were not only me, they were a couple of us friends. We spoke that if such a course like master's course is started by Tibet House. Uh, so there was an interest uh, and I had some international friends also who showed interest. So then I kept requesting Venul Geshe and eventually on my third or probably fourth request he agreed. And we were extremely fortunate that His Holiness uh, the 14th Dalai Lama agreed to launch the course on 9th December 2016. Uh, it was a big event. Uh, it was also anniversary. It was an uh, event held uh, in collaboration with Mensi Kang and Tibet House Delhi and Thyagrad Stadium. And close to maybe 8,000, 10,000 people were there. And His Holiness launched this course. And that was the start of Nalanda Master's course, Batch 1. Uh, so that's how we started. And then we started our teachings uh, in 2017 and over a period of time, you know, the course went on, but we kept on getting registrations after registration. People were showing interest. And by the way, you know, we, we were not sure how good the response would be. We got close to 464 applications for Nalanda in the master's course batch one. And then 2017 end, uh, we started talking to Geshe Geshe five year course is too long. We can't keep registering people in between, so we need to cater to them. So we started what we call today Nalanda Diploma Course, uh, which is some you know between one one and a half years. Usually, it's one and a half years course. Um, it's the same thing that all the essence of Nalanda Master's Course, but in a shorter duration. Nalanda Master's Course goes much deeper. Uh, so that's how we started NDC. We've completed three batches of NDC, Nalanda Diploma Course, one batch of Nalanda Master's Course, uh, NDC 3 and NMC 1 recently finished. And just recently we started a two-month course which is called Nalanda Certificate Course. Again, 
there was a need that we felt uh, that there are people who have extremely busy lives they can't commit themselves to one and a half course and also we are starting nalanda masters course batch 2 in october and one of the qualification we need for nalanda masters course is some basic foundation in buddhist philosophy so either you've done a nalanda diploma course before then we would give admission in nmc so since nmc is once in a five year opportunity we felt a great need to introduce this course of two months so that people get some idea when if they are interested to join nmc2 uh this is where we started and venerable geshla has been very kind single handedly he has taught all these courses he is still teaching them and obviously we have a great support team in it uh you know program management uh admin team uh multimedia team who support these courses without that it's not possible so this is a brief brief you know short introduction about none of the courses as of now we have close to maybe about 28 100 people from across 80 countries across all these courses uh so that's and we still getting registrations for ncc so i don't know where the count will close and on um, 6th of july this year uh, coinciding with uh, birthday of his holiness uh, we are going to open registration for nmc2 nalan the masters course and the teachings will begin this year on 2nd october so that's about on the courses and the whole motivation for these courses was not to like make people buddhist but whoever you are if you're doing these courses or if you're interested in these courses that you become a better human being a happier human being so you know in your family there's more love and care uh, there's more peace around and like his own and says that you know we are 7 billion plus people as one family you know so our aim uh, has been that to spread this message of his holiness through this profound nalanda philosophy uh, which i think uh, I'm, i'm an indian so i can very very safely say we indians have forgotten it and we should thank uh, you know his holiness for reviving this tradition and uh, making it available to public and uh, you know that people can use transform their minds and become happier beings okay that's about it from my side thank you thank you for uh, giving attention and listening to this thank you and with this uh, auspicious gathering uh, tibel house is delighted as dipesh has mentioned to launch the batch to nalanda masters course with the presence of our special guest ambassador virendra gupta ji and dr s p agarwal by holding the poster on his hand on their hands Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Now I would like to request our special guest Dr. S. P. Agarwal ji to kindly address the gathering and allow me to introduce Dr. S. P. Agarwal. Dr. Professor S. P. Agarwal is currently principal at Ramanujan College University of Delhi after doing his PhD coursework in international management studies at the universities of University of Texas at Dallas in 1987 he came back to india and obtained the phd from university of shambalpur orissa on the basis of phd coursework he was awarded awarded ma ims by university of texas He also did MBA from University of Houston United States in the year of 1987. He is a principal of AK Ramanujan College Delhi University since from May 2008 till date. He has published several articles and some of the notable ethics related contributions are role of ethics and value in values in modern education in international journal for applied ethics. Please welcome Dr. S. P. Agarwal ji.
Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, good morning. Dignitaries on the dais, uh, special guest Ambassador Virendra Gupta ji, keynote speaker and our personal friend and a good human being, Van Gashe Dorji Damdulji, Director Tibet House. Uh, not only he is a friend and uh, friend to the institution, he has visited my institution several times and we did two international conferences uh, in collaboration. Dr. Kaveri Gill, whom we just heard, professor and head at Sivnadar University International Relations and Governance Studies, she practiced. Mr. Karma Sikoye, Tibetan contemporary artist, whom we just heard, and uh, you know, he's very right that uh, art is a spirituality and a meditation. Uh, Mr. Dipesh Thakkar could not join us, we just heard him. Mr. Tenjing Chokden, Secretary Tibet House, all the respected delegates, participants, young minds. Uh, first of all, let me tell you, I'm really honored to be here to speak before you on this historic occasion to commemoration of 87th birth anniversary of His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama. I, I uh, pay uh, regards to him, my institution, my teachers, my uh, students all pay respect to Shri Dalai Lama Ji. Uh, well, let me tell you that uh, basically I am an administrator and uh, though, you know, I practice some of the principles of uh, ethics and I will explain to you as an administrator, how I have used this to, to revive an institution and to do certain things. Well, first of all, I quote Dalai Lama Ji, uh, one of his quotes, not I mean he has given a lot of quotes and uh, I follow them very religiously. Taking care of our planet is like taking care of our house. Since we human beings come from nature, there is no point in our going against nature, which is why I say the environment is not a matter of religion or ethics or morality. These are luxuries since we can survive without them, but we cannot survive if we continue to go against nature. So friends, I need not explain. It's very well explained by Dalai Lama Ji. And basically today, we are going against the nature. And that is how we are, you know, uh, basically uh, uh, questioning our own existence. So this is, this is what I feel. Uh, this, another aspect which I want to draw from here is, see, if I say I want to be happy, is it possible that I can be happy without you being happy? Is it possible that all of us can be happy without, uh, you know, whole community or Delhi community or Indian community be happy? Or I can say, how can we be happy unless until the whole world is happy? So that is what we are looking at, the principles of universal ethics that if the whole world, the society, the community, the institution, all need to be happy if we want to be happy. So that is that is very, very important concept we need to analyze and understand. Now, this common humanity and interdependence is the key to ethics and happiness. Well, let me now explain how because I, I became principal of a kind of a Sikh institution, Desh Bandhu Evening. And uh, basically, university was so fed up that let us close this institution because nothing is going on. Some of you might know it because it's a history uh, way back 2008 and 10. Now, today, we changed it as Ramanujan College and a most vibrant and happening institution of Delhi University and not only Delhi University of the country, named as Ramanujan College, following the principles of universal ethics. 
uh, some of uh, which I will share with you. Well, the first thing we started with uh, that let us, you know, start with the basic facilities in the institution, whether it is toilets, whether it is clean classroom, whether it is, uh, you know, environment to be an educational institution. And another important thing we did was to do a teamwork, to involve the students, teachers, and everyone, the, all the stakeholders. So, and then we opened a center for ethics and values in 2010, and that is how we changed the mindset of the students, the teachers, and everyone there. And then we came along in 2016, the NAC gave us A grade, and recently when we go for second cycle, we got A++, which is 3.71, highest of any colleges in Delhi University. Though it is not a known institution, but how we worked, and that is how the ethics helped us see the environment of this hall today in last one hour is different. I have attended so many conferences here, but today everybody's mind is so peaceful because of the gracious, uh, you know, Dalai Lama Ji. So this is how the things change. Similarly, I, I talk of uh, COVID-19 situation. See how Asians or the, uh, you know, areas in our country and uh, neighboring countries and the West dealt with COVID-19. The major uh, problem was in West, Western countries. Of course, in our countries also we face that problem. But why? Because we left the principle of a common community. Because if there is some COVID patient, oh, he, he can, he's untouchable. So that is how the problem arises. Some, uh, most of the problem was that we did not take care of our own patients. So that is what created havoc in the community as such. And if, you know, you see the support system in villages and small places was much better than in cities. Similarly, in the, uh, you know, when we compare it with the West. So what I'm trying to say that if we could have followed those principles of ethics and principles of happiness, we would have not, we, we could have, you know, faced this crisis much better. Another one minute I will take, madam. Uh, see, recently, Government of India has come up with NAP 2020. And our basic objective is to make education holistic, integrated, enjoyable, and engaging. How can we make it? It's a very simple word, holistic. But unless until we follow the principles, we do those kind of teachings. Nalanda has launched courses on that. I wish we could at Delhi University. So we can reform, we can integrate these value system in our science, in our arts, in our commerce stream, then things can change. Otherwise, it is very difficult. And similarly, we need to achieve the basic principles of quality education, the equity, equality, relevance, inclusivity, and learning together, learning in a society, learning in a common place. That is very, very important. So similarly, you know, what I can say that again, Dalai Lama was very, very particular that how rapid technological, technological changes are affecting the lives of young minds. So we have to analyze that also. Similarly, the conflict resolution, the violence resolution, all these are extremely important in terms of universal ethics. Now, last point. If we look at the sustainable development goals of UNO, is it possible, I am posing a question, why countries do not, do not perf uh, evaluate their performance based on the progress made in those sustainable development programs? There are, I think, 14 or 15 principles. So why, why nations like India or any nation should not see how they have elevated 
the basic principles in terms of basic principles of sustainable development uh, thank you very much for listening patiently and i'm sure something will come out of this uh, conference and we will be more happier we will be more uh, equitable we will be more ethics following country thank you very much thank you professor now i would like to request our second special guest ambassador mr virendra gupta ji to kindly address the gathering please allow me to introduce him Ambassador Mr Virendra Gupta ji is a retired from the government service 7 years ago after spending over 37 years with the Indian Foreign Service. He served as the India's High Commissioner in Tanzania, Trinidad, Tobago, South Africa as well as several other Caribbean countries. He also served as the Director General of Indian Council for Cultural Relations and and as a deputy director general of india's largest security studies think think tank idsa where inter alia he has also coordinated the work of south asia clusters he served as a visiting professor professor at the school of international studies jawaharlal nehru university during 2018 to 19 he is currently associated with a number of ngos and the think tank and take active interest in public policy issues as the president of a well known five decades old ngo antarrashtriya sahyog parishad he is particularly focused on indian diaspora and neighborhood issues please welcome ambassador mr virendra gupta ji <coughs> thank you very much honorable geshe dorji damdul director of the tibet house and thank you very much for inviting me to this wonderful conference uh, as our previous speaker noted uh, there is so much of positive energy uh, which one can experience being in the hall here this morning um, uh, mr karma sikoi uh, professor kaveri gill and professor sp agrawal ladies and gentlemen uh, it is uh, a matter of great privilege and um, extreme happiness for me to be participating in this event which is organized to commemorate celebrate uh, his holiness the lai lama's uh, 87th uh, birth anniversary um, he has brought such positive influence um, into the world that i wish him long life i wish he completes 100 years uh, i personally have been very fortunate to have come in contact with him on several occasions and every time that has happened it has been such an innovating experience um, his uh, message of um, a peaceful coexistence in the middle path uh, i think that is very eternal and uh, we celebrate it uh, all the time when we think of the lai lama um, we also similarly think of other towering individuals that have uh, been um, with us in this world um, nelson mandela Uh, whom i was also very fortunate to have met personally on many occasions uh, now one wonders as to why is he admired so much why is he regarded so great uh, i was in south africa when he passed away and his um, uh, that occasion uh, brought uh, almost the entire galaxy of world leadership um now that would not have happened uh, uh, for the funeral of um, just a former president so why is it that the world uh, celebrated him so much uh, not because he was a freedom fighter there were many many freedom fighters in the world uh, not because he was former president of south africa uh, the world is full of people who have been prime ministers and presidents uh, 
but because of the message of peace and reconciliation. And message coming from him after uh, a long uh, and uh, arduous um, uh, incarceration at the hands of the South African apartheid government. Uh, if any of you visited the Robben Islands, uh, you would see uh, how torturous it must have been for him to suffer the uh, uh, you know, imprisonment uh, in isolation. And yet when he came out of the imprisonment, um, he had no bitterness in him. Uh, he brought the message of uh, uh, reconciliation of peace. And that was the hope for humanity. That was the hope for South Africa. Uh, now a lot of people ask me as to what is the position of racial uh, uh, you know, harmony or racial discrimination in South Africa. I'm amazed at the kind of harmony that they've been able to achieve. In fact, uh, I sometimes, uh, um, I'm a little sorry to say that uh, in India we often have situations uh, which are not very desirable. But in South Africa, a country which went through such a long history of racial discrimination. And if we don't have it today, if we have the harmony, I think it is very largely to the credit of a person like Nelson Mandela. In the same way, uh, I can think of Mahatma Gandhi, uh, who did not hold any office. He was not the president or the prime minister of our country. And yet the world regards as, as uh, one of the uh, most towering personalities that we have seen in the recent times. And that was because of his message of peace and nonviolence. Um, so I think, uh, what, what uh, amazes me is that while we uh, celebrate and admire uh, such traits in uh, our leaders, uh, then why is it that we are fighting so much? Why is it that there is so much of tension and uh, war and conflict? Uh, now, there they can be an explanation if, you, if one thinks about it. And, um, it seems to me that um, uh, you know we we are too obsessed by uh, self-interest, national interest. Um, I think self-interest. Uh, there is nothing wrong with it. It's basic human instinct. Is the instinct of survival. Um, so. self-interest as an individual, uh, national interest um, in the behavior of the nations. I think it's a very natural phenomenon. Uh, but when the, that national interest, when that self-interest gets defined in a very narrow and restrictive framework, and I think that is where the trouble begins. And it seems to me that um, all of us have become very impatient and are looking at things merely in um, a very narrow national or self-interest perspective. We also, I, I said impatient, because we are not looking at things in the longer term perspective. And it seems to me, uh, when I relate this to uh, issues of politics, issues of economics, and issues of national, you know, international relations, that if we begin to look at things from a longer term perspective, um, we would be able to promote um, a universal good. Because then we would be able to see the virtue of uh, the coexistence. Um, the organization that I represent, Antarashti Sayog Parishad, we are committed to promoting cordiality and friendship in the world in the spirit of Vasudhev Kutumbakam. World is one family. Now, it is not India alone which uh, celebrates um, uh, a good concept like that. Uh, in South Africa, um, you, some of you may have heard of the principle of Ubuntu. I am because you are. I am because we are. My, my existence is because of your existence. So I think this uh, celebration and acceptance of interdependence, and, and that's very humble, that's very humbling. Uh, and I'm told that uh, 
this concept also exists in many other cultures, in South Korea, in, in, in innumerable cultures. Um, so I think essentially uh, that led, leads one to believe in goodness of humankind. Uh, now, I, I just want to elaborate very briefly on um, uh, the point that I'm making about uh, uh, you know, longer term uh, perspective. Um, uh, when I was young, uh, and we come from a business family background, um, I used to hear my elders say that a business should be built on trust and integrity. Now, this is something that uh, maybe uh, uh, the youngsters these days uh, don't understand or don't accept, and you want to make quick money. Um, I still believe that um, a business built on trust and integrity would go a long way and in the long term would be far more beneficial in, in commercial and economic sense. Now you all recall uh, um, the American support for uh, Mujahideens in Afghanistan during the 80s. Um, and what is the objective? The objective was to drive out the Soviets from Afghanistan. Now, it is all right for America to have this objective in geopolitical um, game, um, to drive out and to register your own supremacy. But did the Americans think long term? The obvious answer is no. Because the same Mujahideen elements, the same Islamic radical elements, uh, went on to uh, destroy the icon of uh, American uh, liberalism and American culture, uh, the Twin Towers. And we all now today understand the danger that uh, humanity uh, has from international terrorism. Uh, similarly, unbridled um, capitalism, um, which is um, uh, uh, you know, based on uh, liberal values, um, gives rise to exploitation and uh, deprivation. And what does it lead to? It leads to violence because there are dispossessed people and they, they react. And this, this uh, gives rise to naxalism, left-wing extremism, and you all know that uh, this is one of the problems in our countries. Um, COVID-19 has so vividly taught us that uh, we are so interdependent. Um, no country uh, could have survived uh, this onslaught by merely taking care of its own population because uh, uh, coronavirus uh, uh, cannot be restricted to national boundaries. Um, likewise, climate changes, uh, climate change issues. So I think the re why I'm giving these examples is to illustrate that we are so interdependent. And uh, our existence, uh, our national interest is inherently connected with the interest and the well-being of the others. Um, so I think uh, when we talk about universal ethics, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, and it, it's, it's very easy for us to dismiss it uh, as some um, uh, issues of morality and some issues of spirituality and that there is no place for uh, morality and spirituality in politics. Politics has to be hard-nosed. Uh, that's what everybody will tell you. But I think I, I beg to differ here uh, on the basis of points that I made is that um, uh, in, in my view, uh, universal ethics is not about morality alone, it is about survival. We cannot survive, we cannot exist. So it is, it is an existential issue. Uh, I think uh, it is important for us to achieve uh, the requisite balance and harmony, uh, the balance between needs, our needs and responsibilities. And, and not just with humans, but also between humans and non-humans. And I think this is the 
eternal message that uh, His Holiness uh, Dalai Lama has given us, uh, and it is so relevant for us to be talking about this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Virendra Gupta Ji. Now I would like to welcome Venerable Geshe Dajit Damdila to kindly address the gathering. So allow me to introduce Geshe After 15 years of study in Buddhist philosophy, he finishes, finished his uh, Geshe Laramba degree. It's also uh, considered to be a PhD in 2002 from Debung Loseling Monastic University. He joined Gyumya Tantric College for a year for Tantric studies, and in 2003, the office of His Holiness the Dalai Lama sent him to Cambridge University, England, for proficiency English studies. He was a visiting fellow at Girton College, Cambridge University. In 2005, he was appointed as the official translator of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. As assigned by the office of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, he visited the, you, he visited U.S. in 2008 to work with the Professor Paul Ekman, a world-renowned psychologist, one of the pioneers of the science of microfacial expressions on His Holiness the Dalai Lama's book on emotional awareness, which is co-authored by Dr. Paul Ekman of University of California Medical School. He has been invited in many national and international conferences and presented papers on such as the paradox of brain and mind and the ultimate reality, according to the Aya Nagarjuna. Venerable Geshe Doji Damdila is presently the director of Tibet House Culture Center of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, New Delhi. Please welcome Venerable Geshe Lama. Uh, thank you, Tishumla, uh, for your kind introduction. And also, uh, thank you all the, the monks who blessed this in, inaugural session with your prayers, particularly the long I pray for His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. And also, um, respected Ambassador Vrindra Guddaji. And uh, I respect it, Professor S. P. Agarwalji, and um, Dr. Kaviri Gilji, and um, Mr. Kamasijila. And um, it's a great joy to see, in fact, most of you here in the audience, they are my long-term friends. Yeah. It is like, just like a family gathering. And um, we have Mr. Denzil, Father Dr. De Denzil from, in fact, this is a very interesting story. It's a great joy to have Mr. Dr. Denzil here and um, all our very dear friends. And um, you, may also, you may also be interested to see that uh, Professor T. G. Mishra, the Vice Principal of Ramanujan College, who is a great activist of universal ethics. Uh, Professor T. G. Mishra Ji, just raise his hand. Okay. Uh, likewise, I, can, I see that there are so many of my friends here. It's a great joy. And uh, people came, like Dr. Nivedaji, came all the way from Dubai. Um, for this program, the psychologist herself, and uh, Professor Braviji here from TESS, and Dr. Tanadiji. We have, <coughs> it's like bringing a bit of nostalgia from the many years of Tibet's programs here, is same a spot. Um, so, let me quickly, uh, before I go through my the keynote speech, a little bit about 
the Tibet house, let's say the, the things here, my colleagues, they're all very young and very efficient. And once in a while, they, are, they may not be too fortunate to not get good uh, remarks from me. And yet, they've been very affectionate, so loving, so caring, despite sometimes I'm not being too gentle, a little push. Uh, they've been extremely the accepting, um, accommodating, and if I may say so, obedient, very kind, okay, and very competent, yeah. And likewise, there are so many supporters of Tibet House. Uh, there are so many supporters in various ways, in academic, academically or financially, in all forms. So with this in mind, today, as you already know, is the celebrate, we are here to celebrate the 87th birthday of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And we see that, no doubt, even the the universal ethics, this concept is so widely now spreading everywhere, like a contagious uh, the the mental sentiment. This is extremely precious. It's all happening because of this towering icon of the world, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Let us all pray. Let us all pray. That is all the Dalai Lama lives long, that his wishes be fulfilled spontaneously. And everywhere in the world today, believe it or not, as Professor Vrindarji very beautifully said, that these people, they are remembered not for anything, simply for the good heart, for the world. So, here in Delhi, we see that the, um, in fact, I was being invited to different places to celebrate His Holiness the Dalai Lama. I cannot manifest myself in different forms, so this should be my priority. And this, this so it simply tells us that this is how the world loves His Holiness the Dalai Lama. This is how the world celebrates His Holiness the Dalai Lama's good heart. For the world, his vision, not just good heart, good heart with the vision. So this way, everywhere in the world today, Believe it or not, people are celebrating his birthday. So, um, and people celebrate in different ways. And uh, we welcome all those forms. Some people in the forms of performing dances, the song, preparing songs, and in some places, say the parties, the picnics, and so forth. This is so beautiful ways of celebrating this great personality of this world. And we are treading the same planet as he treads. We are breathing the same air that this great towering figure is breathing. We are very fortunate. And here at Tibet House, we are celebrating, all of us, we are celebrating the birthday of His Holiness slightly differently in ways to disseminate what is deep inside his heart to make the world a better world as uh, our, my the, pre, the earlier speakers presented to the make the world a better world make the world feel the oneness the family as a family so with this um, I I won't be I'm not doing justice if I don't mention the name, um, the, the late Mr. Narish Mathruji, um, who, were, who had been a great support for Tibet House for all these many years, since he was in his 20s, and we lost him to this COVID, unfortunately. And also, the, we remember his wife, Anthony Narish, again, a great supporter of Tibet House. And uh, we have Joyaji and Ajirji and Rajiji again, who passed away several years ago before the COVID. And also, let us not forget that the Mr. M. S. Raskotraji, who was the 
the vice chairperson of Tibet House, a great guiding light for Tibet House for all these many years. And finally, in 2016, um, he resigned um, due to his age and followed by Dr. Kapila Vasanji, a greatly passionate, a great scholar, plus a greatly passionate about the supporting the Tibetan cause and a great devotee of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, a great figure. In India, again she passed away and we were struggling because that this guiding light, the vice chairperson next to His Holiness the Dalai Lama, His Holiness as the president of Tibet House, the chairperson of the Tibet House, government body, and the vice chairperson must be somebody who is very competent and we are struggling to find one. And eventually we found, uh, because of Mr. Tempasering, the former representative of Sultan Sadal here in Delhi, <coughs> and also the Tibetan minister, a former Tibetan minister, he so kindly was able to, to identify uh, Dr. Nirupamaji, again, who was a foreign, who was from Foreign Service, Foreign Secretary, ambassador to many countries from India, and finally we got her, and who, was, he, who wrote a book recently very um, it became a very popular book on the India, China and Tibet <coughs> and she um, the, so kindly accepted the position, the vice chairperson filled up this position and um, the, today we requested her to be the chief guest but she could not due to her, the, her family problems the illness of her husband and so forth uh, so let's pray for her husband's uh, quick recovery. And um, <clears throat> okay, so with this uh, uh, very quick intro, uh, let me just give you a, a quick idea of what is universal ethics as a keynote speaker here. Um, so how this concept came to being of course, there must be many other thinkers, philosophers, who must have given thought to this. And uh, today, wherever we, we go, we see that people talk about universal ethics and universal ethics programs being organized. And today, there's a huge program known as C-learning, social, emotional, ethical learning, um, and also Ayurganya's program there. And we have uh, Mr. Raviji here and her son. Uh, Mr. Raviji, please raise his hand. Yes, uh, you will hear him later on. And he's the, he said that this universal ethics is amazing. This vision of His Holiness the Dalai Lama must be brought to the ears of three million people. And his son said, no, it should be 300 million people. His son, yeah. So it's amazing, the young people. Um, the Professor Raviji himself very passionate about this and his son there's a Tibetan expression which says that they say the Pali Puzics means the, the son excels the father and the grandson far excels the son and the great grandson even more excels this, the great grandson okay so this is what is happening this is good news otherwise look at the Ukraine war so many innocent people being killed unnecessarily. Just imagine, before COVID, no Ukraine war. Everything there see, was just very peaceful. And suddenly there's a war happening. How many people? So all these many months, people just had to survive, live in fear. And who made it? What made this person to plunge into this idea. It's just, it's just, you can imagine that. Somewhere a selfish interest. As Professor at the Agarwalji indicated, where there's selfishness, where you are, un where others are unhappy, you can never be happy. Selfishness means that you should suffer and I'll be happy. How can one imagine to be happy when others are unhappy? So with this in mind, 
uh, the, this idea of the universal ethics, how it came into being, particularly for the, those people who are the new to this, I'd like to share with you that it, say, the originally came from His Holiness's many public addresses, and oftentimes the experts, specialists in medical stream, or medical experts, social the workers, educationists, they come up with the one common question. The question is, where are we going wrong? Where the world is going wrong? While the modern education is there, it has already climbed to such a height of development and sophistication, which is meant for the human flourishing. Yet, we see that the world, the world is turning down, going down the lane. Where are we going wrong? His Holiness, without second thought, would say that it's all because of the limitation of our modern education system. We we invest so much of time. In fact, for a young child, say the of his or her life, the prime of his or her life is invested in modern education. Since age two, three, till age 26, 27, if somebody is to complete the PhD, 27, 28, almost like 20 years, the prime of one's life is invested in the modern education. And what is this modern education? It only teaches you how to go for a brain development and not for the heart development. This is what, this is the very unfortunate part. And it is not that the, this is totally to be seen as the viciously demonic, but of course, this is just the legacy of the industrial revolution. This modern education is the legacy of the industrial revolution. It needs reformation. So His Holiness says that we need to introduce a program. We need to introduce the provision for development of the heart as a part of the modern education. What is that? That is universal ethics. It should not be taught as a soft, say, the counseling subject, but as a one of the primary uh, the subjects to be taught in the modern education, to be included as a very important part of the, uh, the curriculum of the modern education. So the question is, where lies? What is universal and what is ethics? This question. Say, to, to make it very short, I already got this two, three minutes education. Uh, to make it very short, so let's say that it, there's nothing as you know, something esoteric or uh, something maybe academic. It's very simple. Wherever you go in the, wherever you go in the, wor the world, whatever, whatever religious background, whatever education background, whatever ethnicity, you go there, and if there is one factor which makes you connected with the, that family which makes you connected with that uh, the community. That community feels connected with you. That family feels connected with you. That is universal. What is that? A genuine feeling of respect and love and affection. In simple terms, compassion. When that feeling is there, this is universal. Where everybody can connect with every, everyone else. This is universal. What is ethics? A system which makes things run very smoothly, which will avoid all the crisis, which will avoid all the chaos. This is ethics. A system which governs the community, the individual, to avoid the chaos, to avoid complications, to avoid fears. That is ethics. So, the other question is, of course, His Holiness, having this vision, he actually implemented it and currently the say, one on an international level taken charge of by Emory University in the USA and um, the, under the very able guidance of Professor uh, Lausanne Tenzin-Niki. He's an amazing person. I really adore him for that matter. So under sea learning, social, emotional, ethical learning and here in India under the Ayurgya Nias program which is ama another amazing program. So the, with all these the concepts, one thing is whether or not the secular ethics can actually be introduced in the world. Answer is yes. And if you look at Charles Darwin's evolutionary theory, answer is no. 
Because Charles Darwin, what he said is, survival of the fittest. We have the basic, we have the instinctive emotions. Anger, attachment, fear. And without these we cannot survive. This is what he believed. These emotions. And these emotions actually divides the world. For example, Ukraine war because of attachment to the self and aversion to the other side. And again, the same thing. The fear. The fear of the, the two sides of the world, the two blocks. So these emotions, according to Charles Darwin, these are the instincts. We cannot get rid of these. These are required as basic necessities for your survival. So if this is how the society runs on such principles, then very unfortunate, the world cannot see a beautiful day of the harmony and the oneness of the family. Whereas His Holiness says the opposite. No. This is very possible that we can bring about the oneness of the family, oneness of the family of the whole world. On what ground? On the basic principle that this compassion as when this compassion is there, all the other emotions required, as indicated by Charles Darwin, for one's survival, all will be, this, that, that compassion suffices you, fulfilling all these the aspirations behind these emotions, which Charles Darwin indicated as the basic necessities for survival. Anger, to get rid of all the, the threats for your survival. Attachment to bring closer to you the factors required for you are so the thriving and flourishing. And the fear to run away from the threats. A tiger comes. If there is no fear, you will just say compassion and the tiger will mull you up. So the fear. Whereas compassion, and that too, a skillful compassion, wise compassion, that will fulfill all your aspirations, which shall have things that and these three emotions can give you. So the answer is, where there is compassion, you can gather everything. For example, look at Mahatma Gandhi, the father of the modern India. So what made he, as Professor Vrindriji said, he did not have any he did not have any office as a president, former president, or the prime minister, or whatever. But the whole world respect him. What for? It's all because of this good heart. And everybody in the Instagram, Facebook, you ask for people to like my Facebook. You want everybody to like you. So look at Mahatma Gandhi. Look at his holiness of Dalem today. Look at Mother Teresa. We see that all these, all the, the, the world loves them. So it's all because of this good heart. Where there's good heart, we don't really need the attachment to, you know, gather the conducive factors for survival. This good heart brings everything good for you. And this good heart dissolves the fears, dissolves the threats. Because with this good heart, every, everyone becomes your friends. So with this in mind, uh, the answer is very possible. Yes, universal ethics is very possible. Only thing is that there should be a shift, paradigm shift, from the belief that we can survive through self-centered thinking to the thinking, to the thought that we can survive through holding hands of each other. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Keshila. And now we shall end the inaugural session, and the next session is on universal ethics of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, the pillars for sustainable development goals of United Nations. And my colleague, Mr. Legman, now will be moderating the next session in five minutes. And before we end our inaugural session, and I would like to thank each and every participants who have come here to join this conference. and. Uh, to all the speakers and its uh, distinguished guests and our keynote speaker for joining this conference. And I also would like to take this opportunity to thank the online participants who are joining live from YouTube and our Facebook channel. And yeah. <laughs>
Last but not the least, uh, the paintings which are shown in the PowerPoint presentation are displayed in reception hall, so kindly have a look. Thank you. Yes.